Another quick tour through the world of electricity brings us to the final section, the motor effect. Now the motor effect simply means that if you have a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field, which is shown by this piece of aluminium foil here, then if you carry a current, at the moment you turn the current on, there is a deflection, i.e. there is a force. A force appears due to a current carrying conductor traveling in a magnetic field. So anytime you have a current in a magnetic field, you will get a force, a force on the thing carrying the current. Now, most of the forces are so small that they don't have any visible effect. But if you make a light carrier with a high current, then you can see the current moving. It's the basis of all electric motors, and that's why it's called the motor effect. The force is always perpendicular to the direction of the current and the field. And the guy who first came up with this idea was Fleming. And that's why he was able to explain the direction of the forces by showing the, the forces as they appeared on his left hand, i.e. indicating that if the first finger of his hand was the magnetic field and the second finger was the current, the third finger, what we have to deal with the thumb is the direction of the force. Um, you don't need to know what the different directions are, only that the left hand rule shows that they're all perpendicular to each other. This is, becomes very important. So mathematically, the size of the force is given by this formula from the log tables, force equals BIL, where B is the magnetic field intensity, which is measured in Tesla, sorry, density in Tesla, I is the current in amps, and L is the length in meters. And you simply substitute into the formula and calculate things. Sometimes this force can be balanced against other ones, but most commonly it's simply asked as a simple, straightforward. So where it's most important is where current carriers are near each other. Because in most of electricity, it's not an actual permanent magnet creating a magnetic field, but yet another wire carrying another current. So both of these wires, which are both carrying current, are producing magnetic fields. That's what happens. And the two magnetic fields of the two wires are interacting, pulling the wires together because the passage of the current is in the same direction. If the passage of the current is in opposite directions, then the force will act as a repulsion. Now, the very basic unit of electricity, the one which is defined from experiment, is the amp. All the other ones can be defined from each other, but you have to have something based on the physical world, and the amp is that unit. Two infinitely long wires in a vacuum, one metre apart, will carry a current of one amp if the force between them is exactly two times ten to the minus seven newtons per metre of their length. Now, if you choose to remember that, you have to remember it exactly. If you choose not to remember it, you might lose as many as six marks. Boo hoo. Now, the very important fact about this is that if you have a charged particle moving in a magnetic field, it will always move in a circle. It will always perform a circular path due to Fleming's left hand rule. This because Current is essentially a movement of charge. And if the charge is free to move in space rather than being confined to a wire, then it will always be forced in the direction perpendicular to the direction of its velocity. And that type of motion is circular. And of course, if you have either a reverse of the magnetic field, or in this case, a different charge of particle, you can move the particle in a different circle. A positive moves in a different direction to the negative in the same field, because essentially the current is, a, is flowing in a different direction. And again, we have a similar formula on the same page for the force on a particle, where choo, Q. Q is the charge on the particle, V is its velocity, and B, again, is the magnetic field density measured in Tesla. No, good old Nikolai Tesla, who was from, who was from the Balkans, but has always claimed to be Italian, but he was probably you'd, what you'd call it now, Croatia. So here is uh, the uh, formula, as you can see, and all we've done again is substitute in. Remember that both of these give us newtons because they're forces. 
And we can, as with so many of these formulas, use it to define a unit. In this case, we're going to use it to define what a Tesla is. If you look at the formula F equals Q times B times V there, then if you want to know what one Tesla is, you set everything else as one. So the magnetic field density is one Tesla when a force of one Newton is on a charge of one Coulomb moving at one meters per second. So if everything is one, then B will be one and we call that one Tesla. Now, we can also generate current by changing the magnetic field. So if changing current changes the magnetic field, changing magnetic field creates current. We either move a magnet or we can turn a circuit on and off repeatedly. This also changes the magnetic field and creates current in the green conductor. Now, of course, this is a small amount of current. If we want to produce more current, then we have to wind the wire around so it's very close to the magnet. And we push the magnet in and out of this coil. And the speed we push it, the strength of the magnet, both of those contribute to the size of the current. The direction of the current is the direction we are pushing or pulling and the pole we are pushing and pulling. As you can see, as we push the magnet in, the current goes one way. As we pull it out, it goes the other way. The other way we can increase the amount of current flowing is by making a greater coil with more turns more closely together. All of these effects, stronger magnet, more coils, faster movement of magnet, require more energy to do because a force appears which opposes this as we're trying to do it or else we'd be creating energy from nothing. So if we have a stronger magnet, we have to work harder, do more energy, do more work to push the magnet into the coil and that will create more current. And this is how also all electric generators work. This is the simplest of all electric generators called a dynamo. And with a dynamo, you can, as with all generators, increase the speed, increase the magnetic field, increase the number of coils, or increase the area of the coils. The actual area here of the coils, the size of the center is important. It, the larger the area, the larger the amount of current produced. So a bigger generator will generate more than a small one. Faraday's law, which is written down as induced EMF in the book, is actually very simple. It's written as a proportionality in the book, so it's just proportional, and this is actually enough if asked for it. The thing you need to know is that Faraday did the law of induced EMF. Though often the question says Faraday's law of induced EMF, and you only have to look up the induced EMF and write the formula I've written in red. The formula in white, the one that's printed, that one is with N, the number of turns, which is, of course, the constant of proportionality, turning the proportional sign into an equals. Now, Lenz and Lenz's law realized that you couldn't create electricity from nothing, that it was coming from the motion and the energy used to move the magnet. So he said that the current produced must try to oppose the motion or else it breaks Newton's third law. And he was, of course, right. So any induced EMF will always oppose the current trying to create it. Here you see a magnet attempting to be thrust into a very light aluminium ring. And if the magnet is strong enough, the ring will move away. This is because currents are being formed in the ring, which creates a magnetic field. This magnetic field must, by Lenz's law, oppose the magnet, try and stop the magnet coming near it. So it literally moves away. It, the little line above it is meant to show that it's suspended from a very light string. So we have lots of forms of induction. We have the one we're used to, which is mutual induction, which is a coil, which is usually with an AC supply. There's a picture of it at the top here, turning itself on and off with the AC supply. And this creates current in what's called a secondary coil. This is basically how a transformer works. So changing magnetic field in the primary that I have ringed in red creates a change in magnetic field around the green ringed coil. 
and this changing magnetic field produces a current. The current produces a voltage. This is a transformer. This is a very rough idea of what a transformer looks like there at the bottom with the different number of turns. The practical ones are the pictures at the top. Actually, what you can see is the two coils round around a middle coil. There are two coils, both of them round around a middle coil in a figure of eight. So it's a figure of eight type of construction. And the two coils are round around the center of the figure of eight. This allows the magnetic field, which is the same shape as I might have remembered, I'm always telling you, to flow in this laminated metal. The lamination is to stop little eddy currents which heat up the uh, transformer and cause losses of energy. Now the most difficult concept here is back EMF, which I've just briefly touched on. The idea that as current attempts to go into a coil, there is a voltage called the back EMF, which attempts to prevent the current from entering the coil. Spark plugs used to work in this very simple way, a little bit more complicated now, but this simple solenoid structure, a solenoid is another name for a flat coil of this type, a, a long coil. This item, as the current is turned on and attempts to enter the coil, a back EMF is formed, which opposes the current. Now, flux density uh, is got to do this idea that as you go further away from a source, the actual flux measured in Weber's is spread over a much larger area. So that its density measured in Tesla is uh, smaller. So the further you move away from a source, the smaller the flux density because um, it's just further away. And the flux, the total amount of magnetism coming from the source is spread over a larger surface area as it moves away from the source. So several questions to get your teeth into here. And I want you to read and try and do all of these. I want you to think about how you would define electric field strength and have a look at the questions. And also think about how you would demonstrate point discharge, which is on a separate slideshow and you may have to look it up. Then this is a very uh, interesting question that was set um, in question 12 about electric field strength, x-rays, the basic Millikan's oil drop experiment. Um, very interesting to read through, uh, show forces, diagrams. I think this one's a, a winner. Yet another question about the Tesla electromagnetic induction, definitely worth a read through. The mathematical questions are particularly easy in this and the voltage time graphs, which are like that's voltage DC and this one is AC. Notice that in AC, the uh, variation comes around the center as DC, it's moved from the center. That's quite important to show. And finally, this experiment where the two magnets are dropped through two tubes. Now, as the magnet drops through the metal tube, current is generated in the tube, which creates a back EMF, which prevents the magnet dropping so quickly. In the plastic tube, it goes through more quickly. And if you do this experiment with any length of tube, you should notice that the magnetic uh, tube or even the, uh, the, even a metal tube, the magnet will fall much more slowly. Okay, good luck with those questions.